Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a documentary filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with us is our documentary filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hello, Josh. Hello, Christian. My, my mouth hurts because all I want to say is first time filmmaker. And it, <laughs> I can't, it's so hard. I don't know, like my mouth is fighting against my brain and it's like- We have been doing this for three years now, believe it or not. Yeah. 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 Um, and the, you know, I was thinking about this. I am still a first time filmmaker. I haven't really made anything else yet. So I am still a first time filmmaker. So if you want to say it, it's technically correct. No, no, he's starting to get he's starting to get the change down. <laughs> no, he's gonna really break his brain. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Speaking of, Jason Rugg is here with us. Yes, yeah, speaking of breaking brains, Jason Rugg is with us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to, but I mean if I have yeah. to. <laughs> Jason and I have a. I mentioned I'm part of the movie proposal. So is Jason. We had one of the, what I thought was funniest moments in the history of the movie proposal, and he cut it out. <gasps> what happened? <laughs> because he, I came off like a total jerk. In it. <laughs> I know, but it was hilarious. He, he inadvertently, I guess, insulted me, but not really. And, and then Sky followed up with a hilarious rebuttal. And I purposely, I don't listen to our own podcast because I don't like listening to myself. And I purposely listened to this one so I could hear that funny moment. I got through the whole thing. I'm like, wait, did I miss it? So I started re-listening to it again. And finally, I'm like, wait, it's not in here. <laughs> and I'd ask him, like, what'd you do with it? And he's like, I cut it out. I'm like, you. So yeah. I, what, I, what I said wasn't helpful. It sounded like I was trying to be a jerk. It just came off wrong. I was not trying to, <laughs> to, to, to talk down to Josh, but it sounded like I was like, well, here's what an idiot would say. And you're an idiot. <laughs> and it's just like, I don't know. I did not mean to do that at all. <laughs> well, you, you, are, you have so much, you have so much currency built up in your bank account of niceness that people would let it slide. I totally agree. I think you should put it back in and re-release it because now I need to hear it. And all of our listeners at Documentary First need to hear it as well. In fact, if you haven't been listening to or watching the Movie Proposal podcast, I highly recommend it. And also please follow Jason and Josh on um, Twitter because they're funny, they're interesting. And that's where they post their uh, little updates when the Movie Proposal is out. It's true. <laughs> all right. Well, we're not here to talk about us. We're here to talk about Christian, in the world of filmmaking, before we dive into our main topic, Christian, do you have any updates for us on The Girl Who Wore Freedom? It has been a busy day, busy couple of days here at The Girl Who Wore Freedom. We have been trying to fulfill our deliverables for the Air France um, you know, upload. And the way that's been working is just to recount this um, deal. Uh, Virginie Durr, uh, who works for Delta, they are partnered with Air France, and uh, because of Virginie, she made a connection with us to Air France, and they have agreed to carry the film as part of all the exciting things that we have going on this year with the Delta partnership. So uh, we were able to make the deal with Delta. I worked it all out. Um, one of the sticking points was that usually they require an SRT file. An SRT file is the closed caption subtitling file. And so typically when you put a film on board, you put a, you know, unsubtitled film on board, and then you load in the subtitled files where people can choose to watch it with subtitles or without. Our dual language version film, which is the version we're going to be showing in Normandy this summer, um, it is completely subtitled. So in the very beginning, we have a title card of the girl who wore freedom. And for that title card, we don't we didn't put a French title card. We had Thomas Boisson do the voiceover for that. And then all of the people that speak in French are subtitled in English, and all of the people that speak in English are subtitled in French. So the entire film is subtitled, so there is no need for, um, you know, for subtitled files. And we negotiated, I negotiated with Air France that, look, we can deliver this to you, but we really just need to deliver it to you with the subtitles burned in. Are you okay with that? And they said yes. And so going forward, I told the distributor that was the case. And here is the file. It's ready to go. Um, please pass that on to Air France. And um, 
I think they must have their process that they have to go through, which it goes to QC and through the post house and they review it and are trying to follow all of the uh, requirements. Um, and so they were asking us for these different files and anyway, something got lost in translation, I think. And so we've just been trying to, to clear that up this week. We did have an issue where um, they told us that our audio files were dual mono and not stereo and they needed stereo audio. And Bill went back and looked at our file and it turned out that Premiere had exported our file and it said it was stereo, but it was actually dual mono. And he couldn't figure out how to make that happen. And that was a two day process of trying to figure out a workaround um, to make sure that it said stereo and was actually stereo. So uh, those are some of the glitches that we had this week. Uh, other things that I've had going on is continuing to work on the events that are coming up uh, with Airbus on that date has now been solidified on May 12th. Um, they have now decided they're flying Flo and Danny in on May 14th, and we're flying to New York City on May 15th, where we've got the Alliance Francaise event in Manhattan. And, you know, the other exciting news is that Hunter told us he is going to be going to airborne school. Did you guys, did you hear this last week? Did I tell you that? Yeah, I thought so. Mm -hmm. So, so the news there is that, um, he might not be going to airborne school. So it's, it's run into this little bit of a glitch. Uh, so we're, we're waiting to see if he can get past this next hurdle, but we've already started the, um, in hopefulness, we've already started trying to make sure that this event can happen. So there's just a lot of event planning. And then the really exciting thing is that we had a breakthrough in our Carenton documentary, um, project. Uh, we've been working to film a sizzle reel this summer in Carenton. And so we've been writing the sizzle reel script. Uh, Zach Callahan has been doing that. And he's also been writing an overview. And we really ran into an impasse about how we were going to tell this story. It's a very battle heavy story. And it really wasn't grabbing the heart like we wanted it to. And so we had a team meeting on Monday night, and we were just talking about the different ways that we could tell the story and somehow a light bulb went on somebody said something about how you know the town of Carenton was a character in all of this and I was like oh it can be the character the town itself can be the main character and I just saw the whole movie flash before my eyes where you know here we have this beautiful bustling city it's one of the most enjoyable ones to be in the normandy area because it has a downtown area with restaurants and shops and little you know patisseries and things like that and it was bustling before the germans came and moved in and that is why they moved in it sits at this crossroads between utah beach and omaha beach and it's this pivotal place and that's why the germans wanted it it's why they built it into like a fortress and it was why it was such a bloody battle for the americans to take it back. And so when you go to Carenton now and you see the heart of the city um, and you see people enjoying it, you have no idea what actually happened in order for that to be possible today. So we just started, you know, brainstorming with this idea. Everybody got really excited about it. And so Zach Callahan came back today with a really exciting script. And then um, Mindy Cook has been thinking about um, you know, the equipment list of what we want to take over there. So we're starting to build our team. Um, we have a, a, a supporter that's offered to help us with equipment to get it over there. And um, we just need to figure out what equipment, get estimates for that, figure out how much everything's going to cost and plan it out. So I'm sort of in pre-production mode for this project. And that's just super exciting for everybody on my team. Uh, and we today we talked to a French a videographer slash photographer who works for Disney over there, who's interested in coming on board and helping us for the shoot. So things are starting to get cooking again on this next project. And it's feeling very encouraging. Yeah. This sounds like a second time filmmaker. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this first time stuff is it's old. <laughs> I was going to ask um, like, so like five or six topics ago um, when you were talking about the SRT file, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I tried to ask this then, but you just you rolled right into the next thing and there wasn't a good back spot to me business. To Go right ahead, Jack. <laughs> Jason. I am curious, have they brought up whether or not they're they want that SRT file because of 
laws or any are they just like oh we need this or is it because like there are actually laws about whether or not you need captions to be toggleable on or off um and so i'm wondering if even though yours is like a weird exception i'm wondering if they're just like we follow this legalistic process um, it's not so much laws but it is more like what's standard in the industry so what is standard in the industry whenever you deliver anything is that even if you have subtitles in your film um, even for the stuff that is not subtitled, you have to have a closed caption file, particularly for hearing impaired um, individuals. Right. And so um, that and is like, that yeah. is a law, right? Yeah, that that is okay. true. That's a law. Yeah. But yeah, there do have to be, um, you know, hearing impaired individuals have to be able to enjoy the film just like anybody else. And quite frankly, the SRT files are slightly different. So in our uh, closed captions, we aren't saying door slams, right? Or water right. rushing or right. stuff like that. So in the closed caption files, those things have to be put in there, all the different sound effects and things like that so that hearing impaired audiences can enjoy the film. Okay, then I just wanted some clarification on what that was. So cool, thank you. Yeah, so I mean, hopefully we won't run into a problem that, you know, but Air France, maybe the person that said, oh yeah, this will be fine is gonna be wrong. I hope that's not the case because we don't have time to do SRT files for this film. Uh, so we'll see, it's always an adventure here. You never know <laughs> what surprise is coming around the corner. So what, um, so we're, we're, we got we're Girl War Freedom, we've got these events coming up, you're working on deliverables. Uh, today's topic, though, is really about your first, well, it's not your first career, but your your career pre-filmmaker, which is- I call it my day job. Your day job, okay. Uh, which we talked about this early on, and, you know, I, I had a, a you know, three-year stint at Big Idea. All the acting is done, voiceover acting. There were people there who wanted to be voiceover actors, so I was I was near it. And I was around enough people who said they want to do it because it, it seems like a great way to have fun and acting. It's like a slam dunk and getting paid, right? Because how hard can this really be? But it turns out it's very hard and you just don't become a voiceover actor. I remember when Christian said she was going to do this, I kind of, not because of my opinion of Christian, but my experience of watching other people say they're going to do this and then not do it. I chalked it up as, well, good luck. <laughs> I've never seen anyone really do this before, but then she did it and it's wow. And so we'd like to um, talk a little bit about your day job today. You've been getting some questions. People are asking about your career. So how, how did you get started in voiceover acting? Um, I appreciate that, Josh. I do want to say one thing about what I recall when I first went to you and I said I was starting out this business. You were my fi my financial advisor. You still are. And um, I was explaining to you this business, what I wanted to do. And you were so encouraging and you really taught me how to set things up and you've always been encouraging. But I could see in the back of your mind, like, okay, you know, <laughs> all right, Christian. Great. And, and then I'll never forget the moment where I don't remember what happened, but I was, I came to you and I said, okay, I've been putting my money in these different buckets. Um, but now I need to figure out something I don't remember. And you're like, are you actually making money? <laughs> Do you have money to put in buckets? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, in fact, I do. Yes, I do have money I'm putting in buckets. Um, so that was funny because yeah, I do think you were surprised that like, oh my gosh, it actually is possible. But I, I also work in an industry where people say they're going to do something and the vat, I mean, so many people just wash out and it's part of it is it's difficult. Part of it is it's human nature. And so like, if you're going to bet you, you, on people, which you shouldn't do this, but you know, you're going to bet that they're, they're not going to follow through. Right. And, and Christian followed through and uh, she not only endured, but she got good at her craft, which you got to be good at both. You got to be stickable and go through all the junk and, and go through all the rejections and slam doors. And I'm not good at this. How do I get better to actually honing a craft and getting good at that? So, yeah, it is. Anyway. <laughs> it is not easy. And, you know, to answer your question, I was thankful to have, uh, you know, 
an education in this field. So I did go to school for theater and broadcasting and in theater, I had voice, you know, voice and speech classes. And I had a cursory knowledge of that. Also, when I was in high school and I worked in the Senate Republican Conference, I was always the interviewer because I loved asking, asking questions. And so I always had a mic in my hand. I was always talking with a mic. And so there was a lot of familiarity around that, you know, job. But it was when I was a young single mom and not a single mom, a young mom with lots of little kids, I was just going insane because it was all about laundry and diapers and, you know, feeding and cleaning. And I just was so I needed some sort of extra, um, you know, thing happening in my life. And my husband was so incredibly gracious. And he, um, I, he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go do what I was trained to do. And he initially bought me voiceover classes um, with a voiceover actor in Chicago as a gift. I think it was like for my 40th birthday or something like that. Uh, and so I began training with a woman named Sherry Berger. She used to be the Culligan, um, the Culligan lady. So she'd be like, hey, Culligan man, you know, this was her job. And so I would go and have classes with her once a week or whatever and began to learn the difference between just the every aspect of the industry. Voiceover industry is no different than any other job, any other industry. And you have, there's just, it's a whole learning curve of stuff that you have to learn in order even to be able to play in the sandbox. So, um, and then while that was going on, I volunteered at um, Wheaton College Radio to do the morning news. And in that moment, I realized the world had changed because when I learned to work in media, it was all analog. So I was editing those voiceover questions, things that I had done on this little machine called a Nagra that had tape running around it. And we would, you know, stop the tape, mark it with a wax pen, cut it with a razor and put it together with tape. Like we were actually cutting tape. Um, and so by the time that I got to WETN, everything had changed. Everything was digital. And that I got a great education during that time of trying to begin to understand this transition of digital media. And so I was learning the craft of, of actually learning what voiceover sound liked and how to make it happen. And I was learning, you know, how the industry had changed. What I didn't learn at the time was the business part of it, which <laughs> was a problem and did come later. Uh, and I learned how difficult it was to actually make money in this business and it not just be a hobby. Uh, so if someone wants to get started, do they need to have their husband buy voiceover acting classes or what do they gotta do? That would always help. Okay. <laughs> that would always help. But uh, no, I think the first thing to understand is when you're thinking about this career is you need to ask yourself, do you wanna start a small business? Or do you just want to do it as a hobby? And either answer is okay. A lot of people do just want to do it as a hobby. They want to learn how to do it. They enjoy it. They want to do it for friends' projects and things like that. And that's completely valid because it's a fun thing to do. Um, but if you want to do it and you hope to make money from it, from the very beginning, you need to understand you're building a small business. And all the same rules apply about that. You know, it takes money to make money and you will have to spend money, a lot of money up front oftentimes. Um, thankfully, all the equipment and everything, there are much lower price points that you can get into the business with. Um, but the classes and learning how to do things, still, you, it's still, you need to be educated. You need to practice. Um, and you need to figure out the industry and all of that's gonna cost money and time. And so treating it like a business, setting up a business plan and figuring out how much, how you can put money towards building this new business, all of those things are important questions to ask yourself. Working with a more experienced person, um, a voiceover coach or something like that is very helpful. Um, I love the people at Edge Studio. I know them well, I trust them. They take you from A to Z. Um, with, you know, all kinds of classes. They're in New York City, but they also have, they're in LA and they have lots of other, uh, and, and you can do things virtually. So um, the first thing is taking a good hard look at what you really want to do and why, you know, do you have the time in your life to do it? Do you have the money to do it? Um, do you have a day job that will allow you to build a side hustle, you know? 
on the side. So that's the way if you want to make money doing it. Now, if you want to learn how to do this in the new, the way the new kids are doing it, let's talk to Jason Rugg, because I've been listening to him a lot on Instagram, and it seems like he's doing a lot of voiceover for his own projects. Yeah, um, so I've never actually done any paid voiceover work. I um, I just pretty much do um, my stuff for my own projects or the occasional thing for, for friends um, and things like that. I remember the first time that someone said I was good at voice acting, I was in college and we made a PSA about, I don't remember, something about like having jumper cables in your trunk or something so that like if you got stranded, you could, you know, I honestly don't even remember. And the teacher turned and looked at the three of us who'd made the PSA and said, did one of you do the voice at the end that said the website? And I said, yeah, that was me. And she goes, you have a future in voice acting. And like, that was it. That was all she said. And I was just like, huh. <laughs> and no one had ever said that to me before. It was just like, I was able to deliver like that kind of fun little voice thing. And so um, I didn't really do anything with that. I, I had always done like my own voices and animations and stuff like that. And um then it just kind of became a natural, you know, the cheapest person to do something for your project is you. <laughs> That's kind of how it always works out. So I just bought a microphone, plugged it into my computer and, and went away with it. Um, I did take uh, the one day class with you. I don't know if you remember that, Christian. No, remind um, me. It's coming back to me. Yeah, I think it was like 20, 2018, maybe. Okay. Might have been. Yeah, I think it was probably around 2018. I, I went down with you into the city and we did... Um, that one day class. Yeah. So that was an introduction to voiceover. I was actually working for edge studio at that time. And I was teaching an introduction to voiceover class uh, for 99 bucks, which they still have actually. Uh, And yeah, it was the basics of the voiceover thing to see if you really wanted to do this. And that's interesting. I've forgotten all about that, Jason. Yeah. That was really fun. (laughs) (laughs) It was fun. We had a good time. And that class really, I think it pushed me. It was, it was really good hundred bucks I spent because it really pushed me to be like, oh yeah, I could do this. I could, if I actually like tried, I could get better at it. And the experiment that Sean and I've been doing of making animations just blazing fast, as fast as we can, has really pushed me to just constantly be doing different voices and learning, you know, different things about it. So yeah, it's been really fun. Yeah. So, I mean, you're basically, you're costs for entry have been really low. I mean, and you were already using a microphone and headphones and all that stuff. Uh, And you have been teaching yourself on the fly and um, you know, you've been then creating your own content. So you haven't been needing to make money from the voiceover part of it, but I, you know, a good argument can be made that you will be making money, hopefully on these things that you're creating. And, and a centerpiece of that is the voiceover work that you're doing. So um, you know, the barriers of entry have dropped significantly since I started. Um, there's the, the microphones are cheaper, headphones are cheaper, uh, the systems that you work on are cheaper. Uh, some of the basic things that you have to have when you begin are those things. So you need a computer, you need an um, um, audio editing software, Twisted Wave is the one that I use. It's simple, inexpensive. Uh, you need a good microphone, you need headphones. Uh, and then you just need uh, to be able to practice. Jason practice reading stuff and coming up with voices. Other people read the newspaper. Other people find scripts online uh, to just practice and start hearing yourself because hearing yourself talk is very disconcerting at first and you have to get used to that. So you do a lot of gigs uh, from what I understand where you you get hired by, for different advertising type projects. Is that right, Christian? Yeah. So I do, um, I'm represented by agents kind of all over. I have agents in New York and um, here in Chicago. I have some in Tennessee. uh, Let's pause there for a second. How how does one get an agent? (laughs) Good question. So in order to have an agent, um, you have to have some calling cards. And so it's the same in any other industry. Um, when you go, Josh, you have a, to make a deal, you have business cards, you have a website. So in order to get an agent, you do have to have some of those basic tools, headshots, and then in um, voiceover, it's your demo. And so when you, uh, you can't get hired to do voiceover work unless you can demonstrate that you have the chops. And so typically a voiceover agent is looking for a commercial there. A commercial demo and a narration demo. And so you need to have those. And now every agent 
typically, if you go to their website, will have their submission processes for how you submit to be represented. And, you know, it used to be they would not take any online submissions. That's changed now. But every agency is different. And all agencies, you know, really, there's different tiers. And I feel like there's like three different tiers. There's beginning agents, you know, there's the middle road of agents, and then there's the top tier agents. There are non-union agencies and union agencies. And so typically most people starting out, they're going to be non-union and they'll start with the lower tier agents and, you know, hopefully get into that system and routine of auditioning and hopefully booking. So once you have an agent and you start booking stuff, like, I know there's not a good answer for this, but what, what does the money look like? I mean, like, can, can you live off this? Is it, is it a lot? Is it a little? How does it depend? Great question. Oh, boy. This is all over the map. Um, and to understand it, you have to understand the, the industry, really. So the industry has changed dramatically, obviously, from, you know, I don't know, 50 years ago to where it is now. It's changed even more in the last 10 years than it had before. Um, some of the big disparities in pay come from whether this is a non-union job or a union job. What's the difference? Well, the union, of course, is um, the SAG now they're known as SAG after union. It's one big, huge entertainment union. And the union works to make sure that all of the people in the union are paid fairly and that the employers abide by a lot of different laws. And so in order to be in the union, you have to work on a union gig, but you can't get a union gig unless you're in the union. So you have to find a loophole somewhere in there. And oftentimes it is a non-union person getting cast on a union production, which only can happen in certain specific situations. Um, I did get into the union through a loophole, which was at this certain time during the new media era, there was a loophole where an independent production, you could do an independent production and if one person in the production was union, everyone else would be taft hartley into the union, I meaning they would have opportunities to get in. And so a whole bunch of us came together, we did it, and we were taft hartley in and ultimately um, joined the union. Um, I, was, I was told by engineers in Chicago, don't do it. You really won't ever work in Chicago again. And I was like, what? Um, but what was happening over this course of time, union used, I mean, Chicago used to be, and still is a really big union city. And so all of the jobs were union jobs and you have all the big commercial people here, Procter and Gamble, McDonald's, you know, Coors, I mean, Bud Light, it just goes on and on banks and financial systems are, are all kind of based here in Chicago. So they're always doing tons of commercials. Leo Burnett is here. Ogilvy is here, DDDB, all these advertising agencies are in Chicago that are constantly doing commercials and they are union, um, what, do you, what do we say? Uh, union franchised ad agencies. You also have union franchised agents. So for example, um, I belong to Lily's Talent. Lily's is a union franchised agency. Um, and so... These jobs pay typically the higher rates because SAG-AFTRA sets the rates. These are the minimums. And if you're going to hire this person for this commercial, you have to pay them this rate. Well, over time, when in, the, in 2008, I mean, things really changed after that, the big companies did not want to pay those union rates anymore. And so what they started doing, particularly here in Chicago, is typically, let's say a Procter & Gamble, and I actually had this happen. Procter & Gamble would hire um, Leo Burnett, okay? Procter & Gamble is a union franchise company, meaning they are required to, to hire union workers. They hired the ad agency, um, <clears throat> you know, let's say it's Leo Burnett. They are a union franchised ad agency, which means when they cast somebody for a voiceover, it has to be a union voiceover talent. Well, they didn't want to pay for the union voiceover talent rate. So what everybody started doing here in Chicago was 
they would then go to the recording house. So, you know, Procter and Gamble would hire Leo Burnett, who would then go to a recording studio, which not is not union franchise. They don't they don't belong to unions. So it's just a recording house. And they would tell the recording house to hire a voiceover actor. And if the recording house hired the voiceover actor, they could hire non-union people and pay non-union rates. It was sort of a loophole that they were using. And so then the majority of the jobs here in Chicago and most places now are non-union jobs and they're paid. You have a studio fee, which typically right now is somewhere between 350 an hour and four or 450 an hour. And then you would have a usage rate. And so, and depending on where your job is being used, what market it's being used in, your agent will negotiate a rate based on that. So the rates vary all over the map, whether it's union or non-union. It varies by the project and what's involved. It varies by what market it is in. And then if you, there are now these online sources, there's a whole bunch of them, uh, Voice Realm, Voice123, Voices.com, Voice Jungle, Voice Bunny, Voice Owl. I mean, it goes on and on where basically like they're crowdsourcing um, platforms where voiceover actors just go there, they upload their demos, and then a buyer can come and say, I want to buy this job um, and or buy this person for this job. So a commercial, I mean, I've had this, I've heard of this happening where a McDonald's commercial, I've even heard it happening where an NBC commercial will come through these platforms and typically where it would be a union job or even a non-union job that would pay a couple thousand dollars, they're paying $42.50 for the voiceover. So everybody having home studios and everybody having these platforms that they can sell their stuff through, the bottom of the market has fallen out completely. And so because the barriers of entry are so low now, everybody and their mothers in this field. And so because it, it used to be in people's mind, A, it's fun to do. I love doing voices. People have always told me I have a good voice. And so, and oh, it'll be fun. And I'll make a lot of money at it. Um, but really it's the same thing in any industry. Only the very top 0.5% are making that kind of money. All the other working actors like I am, you have to, you know, just work really hard to make, any money at all that's a long answer to your question <laughs> I, I did i do remember you saying early on it's good to have a day job while you're working on this um and it, which yeah. is the same thing i teach in my industry you know there's a lot of burnout in in my industry and uh part of it is because they can't survive long enough financially to get to the point where you're you can make a living but if you have a second source of income, whether it's your spouse or you have a day job or something, you know, you got to buy yourself some time until you're, you know, you build it up. So, yeah, I think that I'm very blessed, whether it's voiceover, or where, whether it's the film, if it wasn't for my husband who believed in me and has invested money, I mean, the booth that I'm sitting in right now, my husband and I talked about for years, you know, that he wanted to build this booth for me. And it, I get emotional when I think about it because um, he has invested in me. Um, and I would not be here or doing any of these things if he hadn't. Um, and so I know that I'm very fortunate that I have somebody that's willing to support me to help me achieve my dreams. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't do that. I have plenty of other friends who are not married, who are single, who still want to do this, who've been able to build thriving careers as well. And I know this because there are conferences out there. Um, my favorite one was FAFCON. It's not really happening anymore, but I just met so many people. It was a very small group and who were doing the same thing I was. And you go to these conferences and you meet other people that are um, striving along in the same field and they have tips and tricks and you know other ideas and you hear their way of doing things and it can form your own. And uh, VO Atlanta is coming up. It's always, I think in March or early April, VO Atlanta is another really great one. A lot of my friends um, do workshops there. Uh, so we can put that in the show notes if Jason will use his little button pushing fingers and, and research that. But VO Atlanta is a great place to go. Um, yeah, so it's possible. It is possible, but it is not easy. 
sometimes that's all you need. So before we shift gears to our final segment, do you want to say anything else about voiceover or girl over freedom or anything? Christian? Well, I do want to say next week, we're going to bring Jason Hoban on Jason Hoban and I um, met uh, when I was doing this edge studio voiceover class. He is an engineer at CRC. He's been on before talking about the film stuff. We're going to focus probably two or three weeks on voiceover. Cause as you see, there are a lot of other questions that you could that I could talk about or that you could ask me um, about this industry. And Jason's going to bring another perspective as an engineer slash director. He actually has made my most recent demos. We record a lot because you have to update your demos every year. So uh, I don't know, when I first started this, a commercial, der- narr- a commercial demo and a narration demo ran about $1,800. And so you have these two voiceover files that are your demos, but you have to update them all the time with new stuff. So when COVID happened, I uh, had Jason cut me a COVID demo. And so I would give that to my agents to hopefully grab some of that work. So that's an ongoing calling card that you have to have that you build into your business expenses. But uh, yeah, so Jason Hoban, we're going to talk about voiceover with him. Um, we did just release Grueling Glory yesterday to all of our Patreon supporters. Um, and I, that was super exciting. Um, not a lot of them have watched it yet. So if you're listening to this, make sure you go and watch. Um, and you know, I just want to say thank you to our Patreon supporters. We got a new one recently. Uh, and so I'm super thankful, uh, just for the new people that are joining and listening. So thank you guys for that. And the girl who wore freedom still needs donations. So if you still uh, want to join what we're doing, please make a donation the girl who wore freedom.com. Awesome. And congratulations to the new Patreon supporter. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, now we're going to shift gears to our new segment. DocuView Deja Vu. DocuView Deja Vu. So in our new segment, uh, we are going to bring a documentary film. Christian, Jason, did you each bring one? I brought one. How about you, Jason? Uh, sure. All right. <laughs> jo- Josh, you just get, get to me last. All right. I uh, also I'll share mine. Uh, it's the Netflix, The Alpinist. The Alpinist. So, the Alpinist. So, Tell me about that. Um, there's a trend of rock climbing documentaries, Free Solo, Don Wall, a bunch of these, and uh, there's more and more of them coming out. And you actually see overlap of people in one documentary and another one. And, and it's a whole breed of people, the way they choose to live their lives and their, their skill sets. They're very good at what they do, you know, mountain climbing. Uh, but also, it's just a way of life where in the Alpinist, you follow a, a young man who I don't know, like you almost say he might be on the spectrum in just in how he, he, he does things that you would think a, just a regular human being would not do. Like there's things in our brains that, that stop us from touching the stove, standing on the edge, driving too fast. Like that part of his brain doesn't exist. I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's a risk taker and he, and anyway, he's got this weird combination in his brain that allows him to be very good at what he does. If you've not seen Alpinus, I, you know, it's, we watch it with our kids. It, it's a little bit heavy, but it's, it's excellent. It's inspiring. It's, I don't want to say too much, um, but it's on Netflix. Uh, worth, worth checking out. Awesome. All right. I've got one for you. So I've actually just watched this one this week. Uh, it's the Miles Davis documentary on Netflix. And uh, it is, I found it to be fascinating in the story realm, but also in the editing realm and how they put the story together. Uh, The other thing that I found was interesting when I looked up the Miles Davis documentary on IMDb, there is no director. So they have a writer, Christopher Wilkinson. They have a cast. They have uh, producers. There's four producers and Christopher Wilkinson is one of them. And then um, they have a cinematographer, a an editor and an editing consultant, sound departments, and some camera people. I mean, it's a really small crew. I find that fascinating. I came out in 2001 and it really is the story of Miles Davis. If you don't know who he was, he's a blues, a jazz um, trumpet player. And he is a fascinating, fascinating man. He really did change the industry of, of blues. And he, um, in this documentary, it's all, the soundtrack is all of his music. 
And it is filled with archival photography, which I think is just phenomenal. But it's the use of the archival photography that I really find fascinating, where they they edit the edits that they make make the archival photos come to life. And they do it with cuts and jumps and zooms in and zoom ins. And um, so it's just, I think it's so incredibly creative how they told the story uh, with that archival footage. The other interesting thing is Miles Davis, apparently he must have written a story. I haven't looked too deeply into this. He must have written a bunch of stuff, either a journal or um, there's a book that he wrote maybe because there is an actor who is narrating his voice and they talk about how he at one point had nodules on his vocal cords and cords and had to have surgery and he did not give it the time that needed to re um, to recoup he only had like a week of rest and then he started yelling at people again and um and so his vocal cords never healed. And so he had this deep raspy voice like this. And so they found a voiceover actor who voices his lines in the first person. And it's really believable because when people in the film that were his contemporaries quote what he says, they use the same voice. So he clearly, after that, had a very distinctive voice. And this actor has been able to embody him in his voice. So uh, I found it fascinating from so many different points of view. You can find it on Netflix, the Miles Davis documentary. All right, Jason, what, what we got? Okay, so I was trying to think of what the first documentary I ever saw was. I was trying, I was like, I know I watched a couple when I was a kid, but you know, I was trying to figure out what, what it really was. And it, it struck me, uh, supersized me, the Morgan Spurlock, yeah. like the thing that made Morgan Spurlock a, a name that, you know, um, he was, <laughs> let's see, what did he do? He ate, uh, only McDonald's for like a month, I think. <laughs> was it a month? Was it six months? I don't remember exactly how long it was. <laughs> I honestly haven't seen it because I was so scared. I'd be sick to death after watching that. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely made me not want to eat fast food i mean most any food <laughs> for a while it was all about um you know where our food comes from and how awful mcdonald's is on your body and it was right around the time that mcdonald's added the supersize me option and i think if if they asked him would you like to supersize that he had to say yes even mm -hmm. if he didn't want to even if he felt sick he <laughs> had to say yes and um just watching what it did to his body over that course of a month. I think he was vegan and like really healthy before that. And he gained like 40 pounds. And <laughs> it's it's a really mm -hmm. fascinating documentary. It came out in 2004. Um, and it's just a really interesting look at what fast food does to us. Awesome. That film right there made me stop eating at McDonald's and other related chains, you know, Burger King, Wendy's, that kind of, I had like, I was done. And, uh, <laughs> There was one time I relapsed. I was on the road and I needed a quick bite to eat and McDonald's sounded good. I hadn't had it in a while and I ate it and I thought I was going to get sick. And what, what do you do when you guys travel and you do road trips? Well, now you have other options like a Panera or something like oh, that. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, we, yeah, we don't, I mean, I'll eat fast food, like a Chick-fil-A or something like that. Um, but like your traditional, like old school McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, Popeyes, KFC. I mean, ugh, I can't do it. <laughs> which he made a sequel, which I've never seen, but it was uh, Super Size Me, Holy Chicken. Right. It's oh. all about. It. So maybe we'll like Chick Fil A. Party. So I'm gonna. I'm not gonna watch that one. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. All right. Well, we know what's gonna be on next next week, so be sure to join us for that. Uh, again, thank you to all Patreon subscribers and our newly found friend and thank you to all who listen to documentary first where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it yes you can bye everybody <laughs>